Kia Tato, thank you so much for coming. Um, it's been so good to see us coming to these recent Palestine events for the past few months. My name is Brad Aldridge. I'm a member of the ISO Aotearoa, and tonight I'll be giving a brief, very brief, socialist introduction to what's currently happening in Palestine. Our organization, as Shomi mentioned, has been involved with Palestine solidarity organizing for many years. So the ideas here are not just mine to claim, but are drawn from a collective struggle, as well as my own research on Marxist theories of oppression. I want to hold space tonight to think about the people of Gaza catching their breath in the first real reprieve from the, from the continual assault that began 52 days ago as they attend funerals, leave their homes, and shelter from the first of the winter rains. The point of this talk is not to discuss solutions, but I do want to suggest a few tools which may be useful as we continue our struggle. The talk will cover three main topics, imperialism, ideology, and intersectionality. Then I'll conclude by thinking about what we can do to stand in solidarity. This will take us about 25 minutes, so we should finish just after 7 p.m. in time for discussion. I want to start with the claim, and I think it's clear to most of us here, that liberal democracy has failed to respond both ethically and practically to this catastrophe. So I, don't I think I don't have to describe to you the absolute horror of the past few weeks that Israel's campaign has killed over 15,000 people, damaged or destroyed every second home in Gaza, and that is nothing short of genocidal. And despite the overwhelming response from below, the vigils, marches, sit-ins, and rallies that over 60% of Aotearoa support a ceasefire and 68% in the US, and governments here and across the, across the globe have rejected these calls. Governments that are so-called democratic deciding to respond entirely independently of the people who voted to represent them. The main response by the ruling class has been twofold. First, frames the situation as simply a humanitarian crisis, an emergency that threatens the safety and well being of Palestinian communities and requires an immediate supply of aid. Christopher Luxon takes this approach, for instance, when he calls the situation in Gaza a tragic set of circumstances. The second is a diplomatic approach with a conflict between equally opposing parties merely requires a simple good faith negotiation. As when the New York Times editorial board writes that the solution is for both sides to simply accept that the other has a right to live in peace. On one hand, these, these approaches are impossible to avoid. The people of Gaza need food, water, fuel, and medicine urgently and they need the international community to hold Israel to account. On the other hand, they are entirely insufficient. The humanitarian solution reads the people of Gaza as victims almost without perpetrators, as though their suffering is the result of an earthquake or tornado instead of white phosphorus and missiles. This view allows us to sympathize with the Palestinians without the struggle systemic change requires. We can see the sheer absurdity of this in the US sending just 20 trucks of aid to Gaza and $14.5 billion of military aid to those carrying out their potential genocide. The diplomatic view relies on rules-based law and order that has never in 75 years succeeded in holding Israel accountable to their crimes. But more importantly, this is a top-down approach that sees the Palestinians as the objects of international affairs rather than the subjects capable of making their own decisions. Not only do these frameworks ignore the wider context of this catastrophe, they mobilize the erasure of history by removing Israel's status as a settler colony from the conversation. Here, Israel is an interlocutor rather than a colonizer. These approaches provide rhetorical cover then for the countries that have been trying to stamp out pro-Palestinian activity, countries such as the US and the UK, where they have been met with police crackdowns, as well as France and Germany, where they, such demonstrations have faced legal action. So long as they can call from for a humanitarian pause and offer modicums of aid, they can afford to remove political agency from the masses who apparently should not enter the fray of international affairs. 
So what then might be an approach that meets the current moment with the, both the urgency and the historical perspective required? There is, to start, an approach that centers Israel as a settler colonial because imperialist project, a project that results from the turbulent expansion and competition of the world market. The fundamental idea here is that capitalism operates not in the interest of human flourishing, but in the interest of maximizing wealth. And concentrating that wealth into fewer and fewer hands. It must therefore spread itself all over the globe in search of raw materials, cheap labor, and new markets. If there is one thing Palestinians, socialists, Zionists, Israelis, and Western rulers have all agreed on, it is the unique opportunity that the land between the river and the sea offers to imperial interests. In the colonial imagination, Palestine is the guardian of the Suez Canal, the gateway to India and Africa, and a vital intersection of railways, harbors, and oil pipelines from around the Middle East. This is partly why Winston Churchill wrote in 1920 that the Israeli state is, quote, in harmony with the truest interests of the British Empire. And Theodore Herzl, a founding father of political Zionism, saying that we should, in Palestine, form part of a wall of defense for Europe and Asia, an outpost of civilization against barbarism. Imperial collaboration was an explicit part of the Zionist project from conception, and Israel continues that function to this day. If it didn't, would not be the largest recipient of US military aid since the Second World War. Here is one last quote from the Israeli newspaper Haaretz in 1951. Israel is to become the watchdog. There is no fear that Israel will undertake any aggressive policy towards Arab states when this would explicitly contradict the wishes of the US and Britain. But if for any reasons the Western powers should sometimes prefer to close their eyes, Israel could be relied on to punish one or several neighboring states whose discourtesy to the West went beyond the bounds of the permissible. If settler colonialism is a system of severing a people from their land, their culture, and their resources, imperialism is its animating force. For anyone who still doubts that Israel's assault amounts at the very least to an attempted ethnic cleansing, need only consider that they've carried out such actions before. Between May 1948 and January 1949, Zionist militias led by the Urgun and Haganah expelled around 75% of Palestinians from their land by raiding villages, demolishing homes, and conducting massacres across the region. In just seven months, over 500 villages were flattened to make way for the Israeli state. Today, there is not a single city, town, or village in Israel which is not built on the ruins of a Palestinian community. This is known today as the Nakba or catastrophe. And its recurrence is being openly declared by the members of the Knesset, the Israeli parliament. We are now rolling out the Gaza Nakba, says Israeli agriculture minister Avi Dichter. Another Ariel Kalner goes a step further, calling for a Nakba that will overshadow the Nakba of 1948. This is the very same government that has removed the word Nakba from textbooks, legally penalizes Nakba commemorations, and removes archival evidence of the invasion from public access. Just as today, it denounces wounded Palestinians as crisis actors and routinely denies its attacks as when it claims that the IDF does not bomb hospitals. Israel wants to normalize atrocities against the Palestinians by openly promoting them, while at the same time trying to erase them from the historical record. They attempt, in other words, to morally defend what they empirically deny. I will, I will return to the contradiction in a moment but first, I want to suggest a different problem with these statements, which is that the Nakba cannot happen again because it has never ended. Because imperialism demands the ongoing exploitation or replacement of the colonized, invasion cannot be understood as a single event, but rather as a structure that reorganizes society in the image of accumulation and dispossession. War, the saying goes, is nothing but the continuation of politics with other means. 
It's for this reason that socialists, Palestinian socialists like Sumaya Awad, write that the Palestinian Nakba is neither a distant occurrence nor a completed history. And treating it as such only reproduces the Israeli contention that Palestine and Palestinians are romanticized representations of the past. The Nakba is not situated fully in the past, nor is it fully in the present. It transcends the notion of linear, progressive, and positivist history. It is a continuous and complex struggle against occupation, against apartheid, against erasure. It is a daily physical and abstract dispossession of land, identity, culture, and history. It is not ended. Framing today's situation as only an immediate problem precipitates only immediate responses. We may notice that often when the more left-leaning sections of the political class, and sometimes others, do respond to our demands and call for a ceasefire as they absolutely should, they ask for nothing more than that. They may do well to remember that ceasefires are seldom respected by Israel and always resume. Bombing here is seen, is seen simply as a step too far, an aberration rather than the logical conclusion of imperial power. Fully addressing this problem then would re require paying as much attention to the slow attritional violence inflicted on Palestinian bodies and territories as to bullets and missiles. This could mean the olive and orange trees ripped from the soil, the anemia, asthma, and kidney problems caused by malnutrition, or the young women who can't afford dresses for their weddings because they have to pay for their medicine. Looking be beyond the immediate, I think, encourages us to expand our circle of mourning, to encompass chronic changes to the body, disruption to the land, and the altered intimacies of its people. So they so that we may not only fight for their lives, but their livelihoods, not only their freedom, but their flourishing. This question of mourning, I think, helps us to think about the role of ideology or the expression of material relations as ideas. Whether it controls the distribution of resources, the production of knowledge, and the means of communication will have significant influence over the way we think. One way to look at this is to say that ideology is not necessarily a particular argument, say the line that Israel has the right to defend itself, but the grounds on which all debate takes place. This is a useful concept because while we don't get to choose the political terrain on which we organize, we do get to choose in which debates we engage. Consider, for instance, the recent debate about whether or not there are tunnels beneath Al Shifa Hospital whether it operates as a military base. Huge amounts of effort are placed in attempting to prove the claims are true, or that there's another example of the RDF actively spreading disinformation. And while these may be necessary conversations, disinformation in service of genocide must be counted wherever it occurs, focusing our energies here distracts us from the main point, which is that any attack on a captive population is not only grievable, but totally unacceptable. So long as we continue to litigate on these grounds, we ultimately reinforce Israel's premise that any existence of Palestinian military justifies the erasure of their entire people. Likewise, this is not just a question of disproportionate violence or, or whether or not Israel is carrying out war crimes. Of course, they are doing these things, but what exactly would be an appropriate amount of force? And the charge of war crimes means relatively little to a state that has acted with total impunity for its whole existence. These are the kinds of discussions that can only gain traction in an environment where Palestinian life is seen as expendable and when we accept the carceral logic that such problems can be solved by punitive measures rather than social transformation. How then might we go about forming the basis for our own discussion? To sidestep for just a moment, one way to, would be to follow queer and black Marxists and challenging the way we think about intersectionality. Intersectionality is usually understood as a convergence of distinct and overlapping lines of oppression connecting at various points or intersections, like this, or something like this, which provides us with the way of understanding how different layers of experience can have formed any given act of violence. 
And yet the way it is understood here, each of these axes arrive from a different point and remain isolated from each other until they meet. This doesn't tell us how they are produced or how they may be systematically related to borrow terms from Angela Davis. Grasping the oppression of imperialism is to understand the relationship between the home, the factory, and the battlefield bound together with the connective tissue of capital. Here, instead of intersections, forms of injustice are instead co-produced or co-constituted. I, I don't have a good, um, really fancy diagram for this, but I do have something that simulates it. This is a crucial difference, I think, because it helps us understand how we can act in solidarity with Palestine, not just on a moral, but a material basis. Back in 2020, you may have heard that the US used the same tactics to target Black Lives Matter protesters that the IDF uses to suppress Palestinians due to police exchange programs. But there are many other examples like this. Harvey Weinstein, for instance, in, a 26, in 2016, hired an Israeli intelligence firm founded by the former head of Mossad to cover up exposures of his sexual assaults. In countries such as Indonesia and Azerbaijan use Israeli surveillance technology to infiltrate dating apps used by the queer community who they, whom they routinely raid and arrest. These lines of oppression also include anti-Semitism. Winston Churchill in the very same article I quoted earlier also claimed that international Jews were leading a worldwide conspiracy for the overthrow of civilization. In fact, uh, Zionism and anti-Semitic conspiracy theories join hands the world around. From Suella Braverman, the recently ousted UK uh, Home Secretary, to Marjorie Taylor Greene, to Viktor Orban, and the much of the Christian right, or the far right. Rather than simple coincidence, these alliances can only be made and translated into different contexts because the channels between oppressors have already been made. There is no way to defeat capitalism at home without first defeating the empire abroad. Which brings me to my final section, which is what can we do or where to from here? One thing I hope this talk has demonstrated is that imperial solidarity between the US, Israel and others forms perhaps the most heavily resourced alliance in the world. And so cannot be confronted successfully by individuals acting alone. Whatever strategy we opt for, I think the most important point is that we organize. Each one of us can be activists alone, attending rallies, sharing information, and boycotting certain brands, but we can't, of course, organize alone. Without mass action, we have no way of building collective power, creating networks of solidarity, or ensuring long-term durability for our campaigns. Whatever the outcome of the current situation, coordinated political activity is also an end to itself. The more experienced and confident we are as an active working class, the more power we have to face oppressions into the future. There's a common saying in activism, don't mourn, organize. But we organize because we mourn, because we see what is happening right in front of our eyes and refuse to make excuses for it. Because we stand with the oppressed wherever they live, because we recognize that there is no way to repair this without transforming it. So I will leave us with this and thank you very much. <laughs>